Thank you for coming to the second Hamilton Families Homelessness Awareness Month Community Forum. If you joined us last week, welcome back. And if this is your first time, welcome to the party. I'm your host, Kiriel Noon, CEO of Hamilton Families, and I'm delighted that you all took some time out of your busy day to join us for what I'm sure will be an interesting conversation. November is Homelessness Awareness Month, and Hamilton Families has organized a month-long series of community forums as part of a larger effort to influence the policies and practices impacting families and communities experiencing homelessness. With the series, we also hope to strengthen the coalitions working to solve homelessness and build affordable housing in the Bay Area. We've invited both city and regional stakeholders, elected officials and city department heads, and the broader private sector, including corporations, foundations, NGOs, individuals, and civil society actors to come together to address the unmet needs of people and communities experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity. As you all know, Bay Area cities are on the forefront of meet in meeting the needs of those experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity, and are at the and are at the front line in creating long-term urban policies that foster equity, diversity, and inclusion. The need has never been greater for public-private partnerships and innovations from businesses and the broader private sector in addressing the stark realities of homelessness and housing insecurity. The private sector has an important role to play and diverse contributions to offer. Increased engagement from the private sector could foster new partnerships that would make a discernible difference in the lives of so many individuals and families. Today, the second episode of our series entitled Innovative Approaches to Overcome Homelessness Challenges will focus on opportunities to innovate homeless service delivery as a response to new and evolving challenges. These innovations potentially include workforce development platforms, skills matching and digital literacy initiatives, and developing and utilizing technological tools designed to improve connectivity for those with limited access to technology. It is my hope that today's forum will help lead us to better outcomes and continue to find ways to harness the enormous potential of technology to make a dent in the challenges facing folks experiencing homelessness. My partners in this conversation today are Megan Abel, currently Director of Advocacy at Tech Equity Collaborative. Thank you for being here, Megan. Also joining us today is Kate Sopis, who is Director of the Office of Economic and Workforce Development here in the City and County of San Francisco. Great to have you here with us, Kate. And last but not least, we have Del Seymour, known to many as the mayor of the Tenderloin, but here today in his capacity as founder of Code Tenderloin. Thanks for being here, Del. Always good to see you all. Um, I'd like to ask for each speaker to, take, to talk to us for roughly five minutes each, and then we can engage in a conversation and hopefully incorporate any questions that may come from the audience. Uh, I will warn you that as the moderator, I may have to interrupt you or ask you to allow another speaker to make a point. Please don't take it personally, I'm just trying to do my job. If you're in the audience, please feel free to drop your question into the Q&A box down below, and hopefully we'll get to them during the course of our time together today. So without further ado, uh, Megan, if you'd like to get us started, I will pass the mic to you. Sure, thanks so much for having me here today. Um, as you mentioned, I act as Tech Equity's Director of Advocacy, uh, and my role is focused on managing our campaigns, advocating for our policy initiatives, and organizing our base of tech workers to act as allies in the struggle for economic justice. Um, so that's really the mission of Tech Equity as an organization is to engage and activate tech workers um, and to use their particular skills, knowledge, and privilege to impact issues um, of economic uh, mobility. So uh, our policy platform uh, really is squared on two core issues. The first is housing. Um, so we work on policy campaigns that will help to preserve existing affordable housing, protect tenants, and also produce uh, more housing at all income levels. And we've run a number of campaigns around this issue over the course of the last several years, um, including being core partners on uh, the Tenant Protection Act of 2019, AB 1482, to help secure tenants and prevent them uh, from uh, really unjust evictions that have no basis and no reason. So putting in place just cause for eviction protections um, and also instating a rent cap to stabilize tenants and prevent rent gouging in our state, which very often pushes people into homelessness. Uh, we've also worked on um, data issues related to housing and have worked on securing a rent registry in our state which would help to ensure that we understand where tenants are vulnerable and where we can push advocacy and resources to secure people in their homes uh, before uh, they slide into homelessness. 
On the workforce and labor side, we advocate for policies that ensure a family sustaining job for all workers in our state. We've particularly had a focus over the last several years on the rising trend of contract work, um, which shifts the responsibility and the risk to workers. Um, it doesn't provide them with uh, benefits or security on the job. Um, and we're concerned with this trend uh, that really degrades and depletes the quality of jobs in our state. Uh, we're seeing this as a rising trend within the tech sector, which is, of course, our area of focus. Um, and so we've worked on uh, a campaign this year that we launched to focus on contract workers and improve conditions for them uh, with our research project called the Contract Worker Disparity Project. Um, and we've engaged tech workers on all of these campaigns to provide a novel voice in the capital that has previously been unorganized or only represented by the multimillionaire and billionaire tech CEOs um, who often don't represent the values of rank and file tech workers in our community. Um, so we're really pleased to join the conversation today and talk about what role we think tech has to play uh, in the ecosystem. That's great. I'm really glad to hear uh, that what tech equity is up to these days. It sounds like a lot of your focus is statewide, and I want to come back to that uh, at some point later in the conversation. Um, I'd like to move on to have Kate uh, join us if you're ready. Kate, that'd be great. Sure, great. Thanks for having me. Um, so uh, I represent uh, San Francisco's Office of Economic and Workforce Development and actually have been in this role just about uh, a little more than six months. So, uh, you know, it's it's been a very interesting perspective having come from uh, the community uh, 12 years leading up to this. I was leading another uh, nonprofit working with small makers and manufacturers across San Francisco and the region. So. Uh, very much uh, have come into this role at this department with the view that um, really everything the Office of Economic and Workforce Development does, we have to do in partnership with community and partnership with other uh, nonprofit um, leading organizations and with the private sector. Um, as our name suggests, uh, we do a number of things all related to helping everybody in this city um, achieve economic sustainability and viability and be able to participate with dignity as, as citizens and residents and, and employees um, and, and business owners here in the city. And, um, you know, certainly the last two years, the pandemic has created not just hardships for people, but extraordinary hardships for communities of color, for uh, communities uh, with disabilities. Uh, full disclosure, my younger daughter is, is also intellectually and physically disabled. So I have a special personal attention always to people with disabilities. And of course, as many of our uh, participants probably know, we see a higher incidence also of disabilities in the homeless community. So there's a real personal intersection there uh, for me. But where we know we had a big divide in the region and in San Francisco economically between communities of color, uh, low income communities, immigrant communities, communities of the disabled and the homeless and everybody else, that gap has just uh, widened to an extraordinary um, level during the pandemic. So things that we did during the pandemic to help our most vulnerable get through included keeping our job centers open in person throughout the pandemic. We especially know that um, communities who do not have digital access, who do not have a home, uh, had a really hard time sheltering in place and keeping themselves safe and healthy while also trying to stay plugged into employment opportunities. So uh, being in person and continuing to look for ways to sort of span that, that digital gulf is something we are very focused on. We also have economic development in the name of our department. So when we look at um, how we do what we do, it includes delivering direct services and supports to individuals who are looking for jobs or who are looking to upskill themselves or get into new sectors like tech as an example. And then we um, very much have been focusing on our small businesses. 92% uh, of businesses, registered businesses in San Francisco are small. 
And we recognize that sometimes our smaller businesses are actually able and willing to, um, to be more flexible and to um, take chances on folks that sometimes our largest employers are less apt to. So in many ways, as we continue to look at small businesses driving our economic recovery, um, we look to them not only because of the diversity of employment that small businesses and many times the families and, and others who own them receive from running those businesses, but we also look to them as um, very much deeply engaged parts, members of our community who often are willing uh, to reach out and give a young person, a homeless person, a formerly incarcerated person a chance. Uh, and then the last thing, you know, at, uh, on a large level, when I look at this pandemic and I look at our city and we, we hear words like building back better and our equity lens, everything that we do right now needs to be done with the view that we not only want to build back better, we want to build back and use the opportunity, and I'll use that word, of this awful time we've been through as a way to galvanize really reclaiming the San Francisco that so many of us who were born here or moved here were drawn to, which is this city that has a house that's big enough for everyone where we all get to participate. So whether we as a department are working with larger employers to get them to bring people back downtown so that we can help our economic recovery um, be inclusive of our downtown, whether it's working with our visitor uh, communities to get them to come back or whether it's working with our homeless population. Um, everything we do at OEWD is being done and has to be done with a mind towards healing some of these inequities that we faced as a city before the pandemic. And I'm happy to talk more about that specific to the homeless community later in this, um, in this chat. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much, Kate. Really appreciate your, your input. I, I do want to hear more about what we is doing around folks working with uh, the homeless population as well. Uh, Dell, if you want to, I uh, can't see you. Oh, there you are. Uh, okay. Pass the mic to you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this to this forum. Uh, I'm a pretty unpredictable person sometimes uh, when I give these talks, and I'll use that as an easy way of, I'll just use the word unpredictable. You know, what we have going here, you know, the easiest way out of homelessness is a paycheck. Not a welfare check, not a social security check, not a stimulus check. I don't care how you look. I don't care how you smell. I don't care what color your skin is. You show me two recent paychecks stubs. I'll take you to the Sunset of Richmond tonight and get you housed. Almost anywhere. That's what the landlords are looking for to place people a steady income. They don't care about anything else because they're business folks. They're not social workers or they're not polit polit political people. They are business owners. They want to see a sustainable way to, so they can pay their mortgage. And the way we do it is with paychecks. So we're talking about wage equity, wealth equity, which is very important here in the city of San Francisco. San Francisco is two cities. There's a black San Francisco and there's a white San Francisco. And the reason why I'm bringing in playing a race card or the color card, which I do whenever I, I get a chance, is the fact that we're living in a Jim Crow environment in San Francisco. Um, you all get around city. I mean, I'm sure there's people on this call from all around the city. I'll challenge any one of you all when we get off this call, go out in San Francisco, go to any McDonald's, go to any Walgreens, show me a black employee, I will take you to dinner tonight. And I ain't worried about taking you to dinner because you won't find one. In a major city in the United States, I'm embarrassed to be able to say that, but there is no equity here. Stand in front of Salesforce Tower, I get, put your hands up like this. Stand there for four hours. Count every black person. You may not get one hand out. This is 2021. Wage equity. It's, we can talk all those programs out the mayor's office, 
out of OEWD and we put all these buzzwords on returning back to normal, equalizing this, and all those pretty PR words that probably some, some Madison Avenue uh, 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 public relations firm give, gave to the city. So it'll sound like we are kumbaya. Go to McDonald's, go to Walgreens, go to Salesforce. See if any of those programs really are what we're talking about. I can't get my 42% homeless black people into an apartment unless they get a job at Walgreens. Walgreens don't hire us. McDonald's don't hire us. So while the city is coming up with all these unique situations, can we at least get people hired at Walgreens? Can we make some man? While we're making now, this is the year the government has made has got that big word now mandate, mandate, mandate. Let's mandate you hire some people at Walgreens. While the government is mandating Walgreens put masks on customers, why don't we mandate that they hire black people? We can't figure out how to get out of this homeless situation. Ain't nobody figured it out yet. I don't care what you're saying. And when someone comes to me and use that word, the N word, the N word to me is ending homeless. We're going to end homeless. That's my N word. We're going to end homeless. You ain't going to do shit. You ain't been able to do it yet. You ain't touched and you have no plan. Except some of those Madison Avenue buzzwords, which at the end of the day don't mean nothing. What we do in San Francisco, every year we get worse and worse. And you know what we do? We have a meeting and we go around and pat each other on the back. Well, good job this year. We didn't get our quota, but you let's do better next year. Let's all agree. Let's agree to do better next year. While Tyrone and Sheila are still in that tent tonight after we pat each other on the back over a cognac. So it's got to start somewhere. We do a lot of posturing but we have no plan And what first thing we get. It's almost like being an alcoholic. The first cure for alcoholism is to admit that you're an alcoholic. The first cure for homelessness is to admit that we don't have a plan. And please quit posturing like we do have a plan. Quit drawing down them HUD funds and the federal funds knowing that we don't have a plan for them. Only people that's avoiding homelessness are the people that are working in this homeless industry. And, and at the end of the day, how can we even go home with Tyrone and Sheila still on Division Street under that tent? I'm gonna think I'm at my five minutes. Yeah, hey, Dell, thank you so much. You know, I always appreciate your, your approach and your candor to this question. One of the things I wanna ask, uh, maybe you and Kate both mentioned uh, small businesses and big businesses and hiring practices. And I, I, the question I want to throw out here is one really about uh, an incentive. Can we create an incentive? You know, maybe not a mandate, you know, Dell's you're saying a mandate, mandate folks that, you know, hire people with non-traditional backgrounds, homeless, folks, black folks, whatever. Um, but is there, a, is there a way that we could create an incentive program that would gently entice employers to hire folks who are formerly homeless or formerly incarcerated or from non-traditional backgrounds or, or disabled or what have you? Is there a way that we could do that? Kate, go ahead. Sorry, technology. <laughs> Thanks, Dell. Um, we have had, so I'm just gonna step out. It's, it's a lot. And I think, you know, Dell, you, you speak truth. And I, I do wanna remind everyone, I'm right, three steps into this role. So I'm gonna talk about what we have. I'm gonna talk about what has been done, but I came out of the community. Oh, there he goes. <laughs> I came out of the community, not out of City Hall. So I'm gonna to speak to you know what I have seen work in the past. Um, and my father was homeless for 10 years as well, Dell. So I have yeah. some personal yeah. experience yeah. with that as well. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just gonna sort of lay that out there, not in this state, in, uh, in West Virginia. Um, 
So I do want to speak from some of that experience and not just from a policy wonky experience today, but I'm happy to, to go into policy. So I think the short answer is I am a huge believer in providing, you know, as, as you've just said, uh, gentle but persuasive incentives to get private sector actors to dig deeper. I think similar to your analogy, Dell, with a landlord, they are still businesses. So everything we do that is successful has to try to balance the carrot and the stick approach. And I think that to me is a very important thing to always bear in mind if we're gonna get private sector actors to deliver the, the social benefits that I think we all want. Um, I know on the stick side, you know, one approach that we've taken is our first source hiring program, which compels a rather, I'm going to be honest, a rather limited set of pri private sector actors who contract with the city um, to at least look at the resumes of um, exactly the communities we're talking about. Um, I know we've had some success with that in some sectors, in not in all sectors, but in some sectors, particularly around construction. I know that Another incentive that we've certainly employed as a city where I think we have seen some success again in certain industries and construction is a is a good example. Um, also actually in in advanced manufacturing and manufacturing, which is the field I came out of is when we have targeted training programs where we can arm an individual with a with some sort of a credential that they can gain in a period of weeks not months, not years, and use that credential as a differentiator to get an employer to hire them. I can say from personal experience with running, having run the city's uh, manufacturing training partnership when I was over at SF Made, my previous um, organization, and certainly with our city build program, we are seeing some success specifically um, you know, uh, in communities of color, specifically in the black community and getting employment. I know it's not where we want to be citywide, but I do think targeted training, first source hiring is a start. But what I am a real believer in that I think we need to grow at the state level as well as at the local level is around the concept of apprenticeship, but not just apprenticeship limited to the trades. I'm talking um, subsidized work opportunities in the private sector. One of the better programs I can talk about again from personal experience more than 10 years ago was the original version of San Francisco's Jobs Now program. So we have a Jobs Now program right now, and that provides the opportunity for a relatively narrow set of folks, but folks who are certainly experiencing homelessness and have had long-term um, unemployment and very low income, those individuals currently are able to register um, uh, and, and become uh, available to be hired by the private sector uh, through our Jobs Now program. And then the Jobs Now program pays the employer basically the value of that individual salary for a number of months. The original program, which required federal subsidy, and we actually had that as a city back during the last recession, provided that subsidy for up to a year. And what I can say from that experience is having these longer runways where someone is taking a chance on somebody and at the same time benefiting from that individual's gifts and labor. And in the case of my father, he was a musician. He died a musician. He got himself out and was able to play music again. But who would have known that was his gift from the state of affairs you know, of, of the life he was living on the street? I think what we're always trying to do is to get employers to take a chance, not because at the end of the day, that person is not gonna pay them back 20 times over, you know, because of their skill and their ability to work for a company. But if, if folks won't take a chance in the first place, they're never gonna get there. So I do believe that, um, that subsidized employment that gives more employers more runway to uh, cost justify taking a chance on somebody who, they're not sure is gonna work out, I think is actually critical. It's not only critical for homeless, I think it's critical for young people coming out with no skills and coming from our communities of, of color, our immigrant communities. So that is one 
tool that I will commit to all of you today that we are already looking at what can we do more with. And the reason I say the state is important is because funding becomes important and the need that we have to get more people into jobs greatly exceeds what we can do just as a local municipality. Um, and then we'll keep an eye on, on federal as well. Uh, I cannot tell you about Walgreens, you know, I, but I think fair enough, you know, to my comments earlier. Um, I do believe sometimes the, the faster path forward is not necessarily with the big corporate actors who aren't headquartered here. I actually think there's more potential faster uh, with local companies, some of them small, some of them larger, but locally owned. Um, and I'm very passionate to continue to find more vehicles like that. Thanks. Thank you, Kate. That's a really great point. I know, Dale, you didn't talk about this in your remarks earlier, but you yourself founded a small business, a small nonprofit solution to uh, some of the economic problems that we're talking about amongst folks experiencing homelessness. If you want to talk a little bit about Code Tenderloin and what your plan was to sort of get folks who uh, were either experiencing homelessness or formerly homeless into jobs that were in the tech sector, that would be maybe just a, maybe two minutes about tech Code Tenderloin. Yeah, sure. So what we did here, you know, I run a, a tour organization that tours the Tenderloin. So what I what was happening as I'm going through the Tenderloin with groups of folks, European folks, you know what I mean? The color were European, you know what I mean? So I'm taking these folks to the Tenderloin and my black and brown brothers and sisters who are living in the tents on the street are wondering why, why, am, I, why am I taking these people through their neighborhood? through the encampments. What am I telling these folks about those folks in the encampment? Uh, are you telling them that we don't want to work? Are you telling them we want to be in this in this tent? And we don't, but we got to put shoes on our feet just like they do. We have to buy pampers for our, di for our babies just like they do. We got to put gas in our cars just like they do, but we can't go to the Apple store. And one girl said specifically, you ever see anyone in the Apple store that looks like me? And I said, yeah, you're right. I haven't seen anyone that looks like you. And they said, that, that part. She went in her pocket and pulled her phone out. It was an Apple phone, an iPhone. She said, we use their products, but they won't let us in the building. So that's why we stand on the corner selling dope. That's why we land in this tent, because we are not part of being invited into these organizations. So what we do, I went to the tech community and I asked one about that. Why don't you hire my black and brown people from the Tenloy? Oh, well, they don't know how to code. They don't know how to program. They don't know how to do this and that. So, okay, I'll open a school teaching folks from the encampments how to code, how to program, how to engineer, how to IT, and all that. And since, and that's been seven years ago, and we've got several hundred folks working at Salesforce, Twitter, uh, Microsoft, Zendesk, Facebook, Google, and on and on and on. Uh, we just got a, we just one of your IT people at the place used to be at Glide. We just got him hired two, I think two weeks ago, IT professionals. Good, that's so great. That's one way out. So I, I wanna uh, ask Megan to chime in here for a second. Um, I know we've been talking a lot about sort of local efforts to sort of increase the opportunity for folks who are experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity. I know you mentioned there were some statewide initiatives uh, that you guys are working on. Are there sort of statewide sort of things around some of the things that like that uh, that Kate mentioned, like apprenticeship efforts or jobs now programs, like statewide sort of efforts that you guys are working on that would help incentivize uh, employers hiring folks with maybe non-traditional backgrounds? Yeah, one of the things that we saw laid bare so incredibly clearly as the pandemic hit was just how important connectivity is for folks schooling, for jobs, um, and really just to engage in our society. Um, and this has been a need that's been long standing, but I think the pandemic really helped to catalyze and accelerate the urgency around connectivity. Um, and so right when the pandemic hit, we heard directly from tech workers who saw this need existing and said, you know, what can I do to get people the laptops that they need to do schooling, to do jobs remotely, um, to, you know, continue to engage as we all um, hunkered down. Um, and so 
Uh, we're, you know, a policy and research organization, but, you know, our, our base that we organize our tech workers and they were really excited to, to donate laptops and to donate technology that would facilitate this for folks. So we partnered with a uh, tech exchange and uh, had tech workers, you know, arranging pickups and, and getting technology where it needed to go. Um, we had a number of volunteers who, you know, did the IT work that was necessary to wipe those laptops clean and get them ready to be distributed to folks in the community. Um, so we were really excited to see the energy that tech workers were bringing to this really urgent need. Um, and then we started to think about how do we expand this um, to, you know, a policy um, that can help to address these connectivity issues. So we joined in coalition with a number of organizations, including Common Sense Kids Action and Electronic Frontier Foundation to pass a package of legislation um, called Broadband for All. Uh, and this is a $6 billion multi-year investment uh, that will expand access and broadband coverage uh, through the construction of a state-owned open access uh, network um, to connect underserved individuals. Um, and so, you know, ensuring that the internet is available to everyone who needs it and also ensuring that that connectivity is reliable such that folks can do their schooling and do their work is incredibly crucial at this time. Um, and we're pleased that the governor has signed Broadband for All into law this year and, you know, there's certainly more work to be done on connectivity, but our tech worker base lobbied on that bill um, and met with legislators to really illustrate the importance of the internet as a tool of ec economic mobility. Um, and many folks within our base who are, you know, currently, you know, senior, senior engineers at some of the biggest tech companies um, in the Bay Area we're speaking to legislators and basically saying, if I didn't have access to the internet reliably growing up, I wouldn't be the engineer that I am today. I would not have the economic opportunity that I currently have access to, and we need to expand that access in our state. Um, so that was a really important campaign for us and for our base to ensure this connectivity through the pandemic and onward. That's fantastic. That's really great work, and I'm really glad the governor signed it uh, into law as well. I know early on in the pandemic, we we also noticed in Hamilton families that our families were not prepared to, you know, to move to a digital environment. And so we scrambled and worked with our philanthropists, with individuals and companies to, you know, you know to get donated uh, laptops and tablets and so, so on so that we could distribute them to the families so the, fam so the kids could do distance learning, families could log into work, et cetera, et cetera. And it was a huge effort. One of the things that I, one of the questions that I wanted to pose to the panel is that uh, I think Kate, you mentioned this earlier, the digital gulf that, you know, some of these projects are absolutely crucial you know, you're describing Megan in particular, um, but we're talking about a population who are not necessarily living stable lives, right? Where, you know, you may have an iPhone, but you may lose a charger if you're living in a shelter. You may, something may break, you know, you're not, you're not updating your stuff regularly. So I feel like there's a, a foundational question of how do we, get the basics of technology into the folks, into the hands of folks, so they can access some of these opportunities that are being offered in digital spaces. Um, you know, a lot of our folks aren't technically, aren't technologically savvy. So how can we, that, that seems to be sort of baseline, like how do we get them to that first place where they can even utilize some of the stuff that's, that's being created for, for these opportunities? If anybody can answer the question, I'm just, just throw it out there. You know, society has, has, labeled or defined the digital divide as lack of devices. And, and, and I commend Megan for her efforts in the providing devices to folks that don't have them. We at Code Tenloy, we, we give away hundreds of laptops a year. Uh, we get them in and they go right out the door the same day almost. We have organizations that are donating by the dozens. Um, for example, eBay asked me what I needed. I said I needed a few laptops and they delivered 100 brand new MacBooks the next day. Uh, and we've had several companies, Microsoft, uh, PagerDuty. I mean, they gave us by the, by the truck. We had to rent a U-Haul truck to pick up computers just last month. Uh, so that is not our biggest issue. Or not, let me not, let me just say, this is not my biggest issue. The digital divide to me is a lack of equity in employment, not devices. 
yeah, we do need devices, but what what's the device as you sitting at home getting getting a welfare check, but you got a brand new Mac MacBook. So you're not in the digital divide no more. That's bullshit. You are, because you need to be over Twitter while you sit at home watching Oprah Winfrey. And that's what we're trying to get these organizations to understand. It's not enough for you to just throw grants into the community. They're throwing money in the ten more left and right. You're throwing devices in ten more left and right. But what about the equity in hiring? You know, they put this mystique on the tech community like, well, you're going to be doing coding and programming. What the hell does that mean to someone in the tent? Explain what you mean. Explain it's just a language like you learn French or Spanish. No big deal. And I met a lot of people in the tech community. Some of those people aren't the sharpest apple on the block. So I know it doesn't take rocket science to work at Twitter or Salesforce. Explain this to folks. Quit scaring them. And the tech community can do that all in itself. Just like they come out with these ads, but come out with the ads telling our black and brown and challenge people. Tech, learning tech is not the biggest deal in the world. Let them know that only 60% of the jobs in tech require you to code or program. The rest of them are, are sales, marketing, management, front desk, a mail room, facilities maintenance, and on and on and on. But you're in the building. There's plenty of jobs inside that building. That's to recruit to get people inside the building and quit scaring the hell out of them because they'll think, I didn't go to Stanford. Why would Twitter hire me? Most of the people at Twitter did not go to Stanford. I don't think Jack Dorsey, the founder, went to college. I don't think he completed college. And most of the other tech gurus have not completed college. So we just got to bring it, bring that fear level down. Because part of our problem, even, the, even at Walgreens and, 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 and McDonald's, we're afraid to apply. So it's not all on those. And, and to make the record clear, most of these abuses in San Francisco are from franchise owners, not from corporate. I don't believe Walgreens corporate knows the, the disparity in San Francisco. It's these independent franchise, franchise owners. So if we can get the fear out of us being afraid to go there, and we and I tell people, well, go apply here. Well, I don't see nobody that looks like me, so why, why are you going to waste my time? I'm not going to be the pioneer. And the other thing we need to do, someone mentioned, I think, Megan, about the uh, uh, subsidies. Very good idea. I'm a, Megan or Kate, very good idea. One of the biggest problems we have, and no one recognizes it, in employing our homeless or, or even people that are cop searching, is two things. Like with me, if you give me a job today, I live, I'm in a stable house for the last 20, 10 years or whatever. I know how I'll get there today. I know how I'll get there tomorrow. I know what buses to catch. But what if I'm cop surfing? What if tomorrow night I'm going to be at Carrie L's house? I don't know how to get to work for Miss House. So it's hard for me to take a job because I don't know where I'm going to be tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock. The other thing is I'm broke. I got no money. How the hell do you expect me to work for three weeks with no money? I want to eat in the cafeteria like everyone else. So we got to come up. And that's what we do at Code 10 Lauren. We ensure you got money until you get your first first or second paycheck. Because it's scary going to work with no money in your pocket. You know, I, I remember going to a job where I had to get up at five o'clock to be there at eight because I had to walk two and a half hours. I didn't have a bus pass. So some of these things, it's not all the corporate's fault. We need, to, we need, as community workers, sure. outreach, we need to do our thing too. I'm sorry to talk so long. I, I agree. Go ahead, go ahead, Kate. I could just sort of piggyback off, off of some of this. I, I wanted to add quickly into the sort of the digital discussion. I agree, it's not only devices. And, and I want to talk for one minute about, you know, an additional approach that we're taking on making the connections to the employers. But the, um, before we leave the digital device thing, we are seeing that sometimes it's not about the device, it's about folks actually knowing how to navigate the device itself to access information. And I know that we've been really focused on, um, often on laptops, on computers. But if you look at models in developing countries, the focus has been on mobile devices and on our apps being yeah. much more easy to access, including yeah. filling out a job application and submitting information about yourself. I think we're sort of overly dependent on people needing full-on computers. We're focusing more on making our apps, whether it's a private employer or the city, more responsive to folks who are accessing our information through mobile devices, incredibly important. And the other thing I wanted to say on the 
feeling intimidated to walk into a, an employer, whether it's Walgreens or it's Salesforce. You know, we, we just did sort of a huge experiment last week. I, I will credit my workforce team under Director Arce for sort of leading the charge. But we did a huge outdoor hiring event and we did it outdoors because of COVID. But the sort of the hidden benefit of doing it outdoors is it was way less intimidating for anyone to kind of, you could sign up, but then when you got there, you could kind of see what was going on. You could see the employer sitting at their table. You could see people that looked like you talking to them. It didn't feel scary and intimidating. I, I can imagine, because I remember gazillions of years ago before I was in the nonprofit sector, you know, trying to apply for a job in, in high-tech manufacturing, and I didn't go to Stanford either. It's just scary to walk into these big shiny buildings. And so, you know, one thing I will say today is that hiring fair pulled in a thousand people, more than a thousand people. We had employers um, interviewing again outdoors in a non-threatening environment, hiring some people on the spot. It went so well that we're now in the process of planning a bunch more starting next month. I know the mayor, the mayor leaned over and said, we should do one of these every month. So she's really excited that we do more of these. But what we are going to do is sort of do it by sector next time. So the one that we're gonna to try to get going in December is gonna be all city departments because a lot of private sector employers don't really hire a lot in December, but the city does. And we have a lot going on here. We're gonna do one with a technology focus. We're gonna do one with a healthcare focus. Um, and we're going to do them all outdoors. In fact, the one that we're going to do in December, uh, we are going to try to do in Civic Center Plaza. So it's going to make for a real easy commute for folks living in the Tenderloin who want to, you know, explore the potential for a job. But yeah, I, I couldn't have imagined how important doing it outdoors, what a difference it made kind of in the vibe of the approachability of the, of the employers. Yeah, and if I could just chime in, I know maybe we're a little bit short on time, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, that Tech Equity um, has been really thinking about this cultural issue for a long time. Um, how do we make tech companies more welcoming um, to ensure that folks from different backgrounds um, can come into the workplace? And so we developed a guide called the System Reset Implementation Guide that really illustrates for tech workers, for the people that are doing this hiring, how systemic racism affects employment and incarceration, uh, which intersect to exclude black and brown people from the workplace. And so this guide provides, you know, a practical pathway for tech companies to disrupt this dynamic and develop a plan for hiring, returning people and developing a supportive and welcoming culture. Um, and of course, you know, the overlap between people that experience homelessness and people who are formerly incarcerated um, is, you know, really strong overlap. So uh, focusing on hiring formerly incarcerated people, you know, reduces these economic inequities that impact communities of color in particular. Um, and inclusive hiring and retention practices, you know, bolster companies as well. Research suggests that uh, it increases efficiency at companies and expands a limited labor pool. And so we really wanted to create uh, materials that really spoke to tech companies directly. There's a lot of really amazing hiring guides out there that explain the benefits of hiring formerly incarcerated people for manufacturing or food service. Um, but there wasn't really something out there that spoke directly to tech companies and to tech workers who want to advocate for changes and practices at their companies. So uh, we were really pleased to work with um, OEWD with Tech SF specifically on this guide. And we actually just launched the guide a couple of weeks ago and, and we'll have a campaign to pair with that. So um, we're really looking forward to shifting the culture within tech um, so that employers are more aware of some of the issues that Dell and Kate just raised. That sounds great. Can, can I tell a quick two minute story based on what Megan just said? Sure. Okay. Okay. I, I had a bunch of young men, uh, former former gang members and former drug dealers, and they were like recently former, if you don't know, know what I mean, within hours. And I, we, I had a day set to visit Twitter, uh, and I brought these 11 young black men 
to Twitter. Now, Colt Tenloin is only four blocks away from Twitter. It took me almost an hour to get there because they kept dropping out. I, we don't want to go. We don't want, you're not taking us over there. You're just using, using us for your purpose. you just front now. you just front now. And we fought all the way there. Finally got him into the building. We go to security and they're mad. They're mad as hell at me there because they just know I'm fronting them. And we go upstairs and we, we're in the conference room, which is a glass enclosed conference room in the middle of the work floor. And there's people passing by, passing by, passing by. And they're sitting there, let's get the hell out of here. I says, no, we got a couple out. No, we don't want, we don't want to hear this shit. These people don't want us in here. Look at them. They don't look like us. Look at them looking at us. And they, oh, they were mad. They, they were ready to do something to me. So the Twitter people come in the room and they're like, well, who are you? What's your name? And my guys wouldn't say nothing. All they wanted to do was get out of here. They didn't want no parts of this. They was getting pissed off by the moment. Just when it got really tight, where they were really go mutiny on me, three black, young black Twitter employees, men, passed by the office with on their laptops, on their lap as they're walking. My guys locked eyes with them and watched them walk all the way through the floor and walked out of the room. As soon as they got out of sight, my guys started saying, sir, sir, can I ask you this? I had to drag them out of Twitter because they saw someone that looked like them. And that was, yeah. it's so important to do. It is, it's huge. I, so I'm hearing a couple of things that I just want to, I want to call, I want to name while we're still in the middle of the conversation. I'm hearing that knowledge is important, culture is important. I'm hearing that policy is important. I'm hearing implementation strategies are important. You know, like hit your example of having an outdoor workforce. I mean, that's, a, that's an implementation strategy, but right? do it outside. Right, and I feel like the work that Megan and uh, your organization are doing, Tech Equity, um, is a lot around policy, changing policy, and doing that kind of le that level of work. And Dell, you're clearly on the ground working with working with folks to sort of change the culture, both both on the side of you know the potential employee and on the tech side. And I feel like all those and all those activities are super important in moving the needle. Um, I wanted there's some couple of questions in the Q and A box that I want to get to before we. We end our time. Um, Linda Parker says, how, how do we get that guy from Tech Equity? It sounds great. And I think Megan, you just put something in the chat. There it is. Awesome. If you guys can see that link, you can get to the, get to the guide. It does sound like a great resource. Um, other questions in the question box. Like the first one was, how is the city of SF OEWD partnering with these big corporations Dell mentioned to create jobs for black, brown, and homeless people. Kate, you want to touch on some of this briefly? I think um, that one, you want to say more about that? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what more I can say today. Um, what I can say is a message received on the two corporations that have been mentioned. And I've already been texting back and forth with some of my colleagues and we're gonna take a deeper look at that. Um, Again, I think right now, uh, setting aside those companies and companies who are uh, vendors and doing work with us, in which case they're compelled to have first source as part of their hiring. Um, again, our focus is really employer by employer, looking at you know, how we can arm candidates to bring all the best of what they have to offer, dispelling, just as we were talking about the the view, the narrow view of what certain kinds of companies need versus really the, the broader perspective of all the different jobs that we have. Um, and then, you know, we, we have to keep our eye on the ball and keep measuring it. And the other thing I would be remiss in mentioning today is the city's Dreamkeeper set of initiatives, which is um, managed through our human rights commission, but OEWD is one of several departments that are partnering on that and our Dreamkeeper funding that flows through OEWD are focused very specifically on getting black men and women jobs and on helping black men and women who are trying to start businesses to successfully get those businesses up and off the ground. And we are all being highly accountable to tracking those metrics. You know, one other piece that I'll say that's important to be said the city is one piece of it. Our community partners, we have two of them on the call today, um, are kind of the heart and soul of how we get impact. And, you know, I think sometimes folks look at the city, I know I used to before I worked at the city myself, as, you know, sort of the city should fix this stuff. And the reality is we have to fix this stuff together. And 
we, the city, have a role to play and I want to continue to do better. I also know that we can't possibly get the scale of impact that we all need without two things. Again, our community partners and without, um, in the case of employment, our employers playing ball too. So, you know, we are at all times having to look at this. But I do think Dreamkeeper is, uh, it is our biggest concerted effort ever, right, to really focus in on the Black community. And we are frankly looking at it within OAWD, not just as a set of approaches and the way we look at impact and the way we look at access as something that we can really dig into with our community partners who are mostly the ones doing the implementation. But I also see it frankly as the template for then how we do the rest of our programs. Because at the end of the day, for me, however long it takes, success is not that we have to only have this program called Dreamkeeper because that's the only way we know how to get the results that we want in the Black community. The real end game is that we take the learnings from those programs and those investments and make it so a person of color can walk in our door anywhere in this organization and feel like they're going to they're going to be served, they're going to be treated with respect and dignity, and they're going to have the same access that everybody else does to, to a job or to a small business. Um, so it's worth mentioning Dreamkeeper. I think it's a really important part, uh, beginning of, of the solution. I think so too. And I think your, you know, your point about you know, partnership being absolutely crucial. None of us can do it on our own. You know, I've been working in the nonprofit sector for over 20 years, and I know that there's only so much that we can do without strong partnership with the city and without strong partnership from the private sector. I think the tighter and tighter those collaborations get, the more likely that we are to, hit, to achieve some level of success. You know, do I think we can solve it all on our own locally? No, I think a lot of these problems are, are national uh, in, their, in their impact and they need to be addressed at some level, at the federal level as well. But we can certainly do our best here in the city and the Bay Area, you know, to really sort of harness and leverage all the resources that we've got between us um, to really make to make some headway. Um, there's a, one more question in the chat that I think needs to be answered. It says, what does this group say to the assumption that people make that homeless individuals don't want jobs? Well, I think that's absolutely not true. <laughs> not true. I mean, I, we've been working with folks for years and years. They're, they're desperate for jobs. I think that's, in fact, absolutely not true. Um, and, you know, I think that is a common perception. And I think one of the things that we've been doing here at Hamilton is trying to bridge the empathy gap so that people who are housed have better empathy and more understanding of the actual lives that people who are experiencing homelessness live. So these misperceptions don't carry on. I think there are a lot of misperceptions around folks who are experiencing homelessness that need to be addressed eventually. Um, and I think that's sort of the, the unspoken part uh, of it is that people have assumptions and preconceptions about what folks experiencing homelessness feel or think or dream about or want. And I, and I think we need to just open a window, a clear window into the, into those, into the realities of that situation so people really get a, get a better understanding of what folks are experiencing. Yeah, and if I can just say that, you know, that statement ignores the, and erases the reality of thousands of people with jobs who are homeless. Um, I mentioned earlier that Tech Equity has been doing research into uh, the growing trend of contract work, which uh, often pays people lower wages, does not provide benefits, and provides much less security than directly employed roles. Um, those jobs are way more often held by marginalized people, people of color, non-binary people. And many of the workers that we spoke with, we conducted hundreds of interviews with workers who are contractors on tech campuses. Uh, and many of the workers that we spoke to uh, were, you know, sleeping in their car, waking up in the morning and, uh, you know, doing janitorial work on a tech campus, uh, serving food in a tech campus cafeteria. So I think it's important that we not erase and ignore those experiences of many people who are employed, uh, but given the high cost of living in the Bay Area and given the, the way that the quality of jobs has been degraded over the course of the last several decades, um, is important to call out and to recognize that that's a piece of the puzzle as well. Absolutely. You know, as someone who was formerly an adjunct professor, you know, I can say that there are people with, you know, higher education who are also working in contract jobs and not making enough to live, you know, not making enough to live in the Bay Area as well. So I think it's not just folks. Dell, you got something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we just recently had a company in South San Francisco, a candy company, offer some part-time jobs for the people in the Tenderloin, they're paying $16 an hour, but yet it costs 
over $26 round trip to get there. And it was only four hours a day. So by the time you get back home, you have work for free. Now you're asking them to give up their welfare or their social security, which is more than what the job pays. So why would you, we got to do better there. I agree. Um, I know we're going to get shut out of our webinar shortly, but um, there's one last question here. It says, is there any movement around increasing job opportunities that don't require drug testing? I know that can also be a barrier to employment for folks who may have, you know, substance use in their past, but still want to work. Does anybody want to say anything about that? Is, is there any, I'm not sure if there's any movement around that personally. Well, you know, that's kind of up to us. Partly is up to us to give these people opportunities and choices. And I tell people all the time, I can get you a job at, at, at 7-Eleven. Right now, you can still smoke your weed, but you're going to make $60 an hour. Or I can get you a job at Twitter where you'll make $160 an hour, but you'll have to stop smoking weed. Which do you want to do? <laughs> I think for some people, that's an easy answer. For others, it may not be as easy. But, it is really not an easy answer for some, for some people, believe it or not, believe yeah. it or not. Yeah. Um, we are down to our last minute. I really just want to take a, a moment to thank Megan, Kate, Dell for your input, your insight. Really appreciate the time you've taken to speak to, to us and to the forum, people who attended and answered questions. And just encourage you to keep doing what you're doing because we need it. We need the efforts in all of the arenas in which you guys are operating. So thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate the conversation. Thanks for having me. Take good care. And join us next week at uh, noon for the next in the series.